I forget. Here we are. We're all set to go. Um, <clears throat> and I am actually going to go ahead and record the Zoom session. And then once it converts into a YouTube video, I will send Sarah the YouTube link and then she can embed it into your Canvas course. So if you ever need to go back and just rewatch something or if I go over something rather quickly and you need to go back to that later on, please don't hesitate to do that as well. So, well, I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. And yeah, it's been, we've had a very interesting week on the Emporia campus because we were closed twice on a Tuesday and a Thursday because of ice and all those lovely things. So you know how that is. So <clears throat> I feel like I've been kind of playing catch up today, but you know what? We're doing great. So what I thought I would do uh, tonight uh, is I'll make sure that you have my contact information, first of all, before we end our session. So you know always how to get in contact with me. Um, one thing I do want to emphasize from the start is I am the slim liaison, so basically for the library. And what that means is if you ever have any questions as you start preparing your research, and in particular, as you start kind of getting to the point later on down the line that it will happen, that you start thinking about your topic and then start needing to do like a lit review and start preparing for um, your dissertation proposal in particular. That's where I hope that you would take advantage of me if you have any problems getting started with your research. And with this class, this is a little bit different because I am going to focus on some library and information science sources. I'm also going to show you, as Sarah indicated, some things that are rather new as far as our library webpage is concerned, how to find full text of different types of resources. But I'm also going to go back and focus on different types of resources that are going to be very important for dissertation research in particular, and also uh, what you really want to be aware of when you start getting to a point where you're formulating a topic and you just want to see maybe what other people have done on it or maybe have not done on a particular topic. And that's always kind of interesting to get into at your level as well. So I'm going to be sharing my screen as we go along. I will probably pause at certain points. If you have any questions, please chime in at any point while I'm doing this session. But I also want to show you on my screen how to get into the library's webpage. Some of you may be very familiar with this if you've done any other previous work at ESU. And for others, this might be a little bit new. It might be a little bit different for maybe other libraries that you've used. And <clears throat> once we finish, again, I want to allow time for any questions, but stop me at any point, and I'll be happy to go back over something or answer anything as we go along. So the first thing I am going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you, and I am going to close this window here with Zoom because we don't need that launch meeting anymore. Are you all now seeing a page uh, with the library's website? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh, good, good, good. Sarah, thanks for raising your arm. That really helps because <laughs> I can see that very nicely as well. Um, so have any of you um, worked at all with our library's webpage? If you have any background, previous background with ESU or with any of our resources, or is this pretty much new to all of you? We it is there. Yeah, I'm just pretty familiar to them. So, yeah, this is their, they're in their, this is the end of their second year, so. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> that helps considerably. Okay, that's exactly what I needed to know. So what I want to do then at this point is, like I said, I'll bring up some things that you may be familiar with, but also some things that are really important for your specific research. And as Sarah indicated, I do want to emphasize some things that have changed a little bit. So one part that has changed a Bit, and it's probably going to be changing even more uh, when April comes along, would be our Discovery Search tab, and in particular, our Journals tab. So I'm going to focus on both of these for tonight. And we're also going to look at databases as well a, a little bit, because again, I want to make sure that you're familiar with some different things that are there. Our Discovery Search is actually an overlay. So right now, we are using WorldCat WMS uh, as our Integrated Library System, or ILS for short. So when you search with the Discovery Search, you are going to be searching not only within WorldCat WMS, which is also available directly if you were to click on this tab for our old catalog, you're going to be searching a number of other resources. So if you have done any searching with the Discovery Search, you might find that you're getting a lot of information. You're getting books that are owned by our library, 
but then you're also getting articles, sometimes the link to the article in full text, and sometimes just the citation to an article. The reason for that is that the discovery search is actually using something called um, EBSCOhost EDS, and that stands for EBSCOhost Electronic Discovery Service. And a discovery service simply means that we're able to bring together a lot of resources in what we call a concept of federated searching. Now, what does that mean for you? It means that you can get a lot of information, which is, also, which is very good, and you get a lot of information, which is also sometimes not so good. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time tonight showing you how to make the discovery search work for you most effectively. So... I'm going to use a sample topic tonight that I'm actually working on uh, in real life. Um, I am immersed in <clears throat> an ongoing study right now of the use of the William Allen White Library building space. And the reason I'm doing that is we've done a lot of remodeling of our library building, particularly over the last few years. Um, and I'm really interested right now on finding out more about how is this remodeling working for patrons. Is it meeting their information needs? Is it meeting their individual and group study needs? Is it confusing? Are there different parts of the library building that maybe they don't want to use? And if so, maybe what's not that appealing to that? So the first part of my study has been a web-based survey that I've been sending out, just getting initial feedback about what floors um, or what services um, people actually use. This would be everybody. This is the issue, faculty, staff, and students. And if they don't come to the library building, even if they're right there in Emporia, why don't they come to the library? So I'm about at the end of that. I am now getting ready for the second part of my study, and I just sent in an IRB proposal, so hopefully it'll go through pretty smoothly. And that's going to be a series of focus groups that I'd like to do toward the end of the spring semester to ask more specific questions and gain more immediate feedback about the use of the library building space what works, what doesn't, what we can improve. So before I do that, though, it would probably behoove me to do some type of literature search. So I'm going to start with the discovery search, and I'm going to start typing in focus groups and libraries. I'm doing a very simple search right now. But the reason I'm doing this is that I want to show you an example of how the discovery service actually works. And look what I have. I have over one million references. Now, I told you that a discovery service can be both good and bad. This is sort of the bad part of it. Because what's happening again is I just did a really simple keyword search. I didn't limit my search. I didn't really narrow it or anything like that. And because of that, I'm getting books. I'm getting articles. I'm getting all sorts of resources and records that mention the words focus groups and mention the word libraries. Some may be very relevant, but as I go through my list, some of them may not be that relevant for my information need. However, when I start looking at my first page, it looks like some of these, and you notice that actually what I'm getting right now are articles. And I am indeed linking to the PDF full text. So some of these might be actually pretty good for my information need. But depending on what it is that I really want to find, let's say that I really would prefer to find any books maybe that talk about focus groups and libraries. The way to focus that a little bit more would be to click on this link that says ESU Catalog Only. I noticed that I really cut that down. I went from 1 million references to 70. But the ESU catalog only link will actually filter through these results. And now it's bringing up both print books. And if we did happen to have access to any electronic books, it would bring those up as well. So you see that I went from one to the other. But some of these books are actually looking pretty good and pretty useful for me right now, especially in the first few. And some of these are going to start getting a little bit less relevant as I go down because, for example, this one is about online catalog use. Might be kind of interesting, but it was published in 1983. But still, it might be good if I were doing a more in-depth literature review preparing for a dissertation proposal. That actually might be pretty good for me. If I scroll back up here to the top, I'm going to remove that limit again. 
And I'm going back to my original search. Wow, that increased even more. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> and as you can see, again, we have an awful lot here that may or may not be relevant. So this is where a discovery search can be somewhat of a good place to start, but there's probably some other ways that I could narrow and focus a little bit more for what I'm really wanting to find. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give you a little tip here. I generally like to keep a couple of tabs, if not more uh, than two, open in my browser. And one tab I always like to keep at the library's web page. And the reason for that is I don't want to click on the back button here on this first tab because I'm going to lose my search. And I really don't want to do that. I want to keep that search going because I want to come back and maybe, be, maybe see what I would want to do a little bit more. And you probably already know this from having done your research, but just in case, um, the fastest way to get to our library's web page is to do what I just did a few seconds ago, which is to type in library.emporia.edu. And that's the fastest way to get there. There's also a link that I know probably you've already had a chance to see in Canvas. And that is a link um, toward the left side of the page that says library and archives. So if you're already in Canvas, you can click on that link and you will be prompted to open that in another tab or another window. And that will also take you back to the library's web page. So it's just whatever is most convenient for you. Well, I have sort of a start here with this discovery service, but there are a few more things that I want to do. So now I'm going to go to databases. Cynthia, before you do that, would Absolutely. you um, tell them or show them um, how they can see exactly which databases are being searched? when they? Oh, I would be happy to do that. Thank you for mentioning that. This is a very interesting thing here. So with the discovery service, and I went back here, this is something you sort of have to not necessarily drill down, but you have to look a little bit more closely to see. So I mentioned that the Discovery Service is searching not only WorldCat WMS for our library catalog, it's actually searching a number of databases that we already have access to. So with record number one, Focus Group Insights, this is from Library Journal. It's from October 1st of 2017. But when you go over here, notice that this says, database, literary reference center. That's kind of an odd one. What that will tell me is that literary reference center, which is a database to which we do have access, it also has access to library journal, not only indexing, but also in PDF full text. And as we keep going down, we'll see this with some of these other records as well. So with record number two, that might be rather interesting. This is showing me, and this actually is a little bit of a misnomer. So the article here, or the citation for the article, for record number two, is not really coming from a database. It's actually coming from an e-journals package that we have that is called Science Direct. And Sarah, I really appreciate you stopping me on this, because actually what I need to do is, is show everybody here something that may or not, may not work on this end. So let's look at record number two for just a second. This is an article. It looks like it's coming from Third International Conference on Integrated Information, Proceedings, probably, proceed, probably Proceedings of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Now, this is where people can get a little bit, um, I wouldn't necessarily say confused, but I think this can be a little bit misleading. So I have a link here that says, find this article from Science Direct. So far, so good. Let's click on that link and see what happens. And I am searching here at home. So I am prompted to put in my buzz in username and password, just as you would be. And we'll wait for this to go. Well, so far, this is telling me e-service quality criteria in university library, a focus group study. And let's see if it's going to let me download the full text in PDF. And I was able to download the full text, so I'm good there. And I do want to show you one more thing. When I go back 
to oh I love oh I'm glad this popped up this is kind of neat so science direct is kind of an interesting resource it's like I said it's an it is um, an e-journals package we subscribe to a lot of journals through this but you notice that actually this is this particular one happens to be open access so a lot of open access journals that we are not actually needing to pay for are also available through science direct it doesn't mean that everything that you see listed in science direct may be available in full text because it may not be open access and we also may not be actually subscribing to that specific journal Let's click on this, though. I wanted to show you one more thing over here. Science Direct does something that's kind of nice, too. Notice that it is showing me other articles from this specific issue. So I might find some related articles here. In this particular instance, it didn't really find any citing articles, but let's see if it has anything. Ah, so when I clicked on recommended articles, it actually gave me some other suggestions as well. So with Science Direct, if you find the full text of an article, look on that right-hand side, because I'm a big believer in, basically it's kind of pearl gathering. It's using your resources or using what you find to help you find other related resources. It's like looking at the bibliography or a references list at the end of the full text of an article. Use this feature in Science Direct. If you find an article that looks somewhat interesting, See if they're going to give you any more recommended articles or if you can browse other articles from this issue. Before I go any further, what questions are out there so far? Um, is there a way um, for them to actually see a list? of the databases that are being searched when they use the discovery search box? On mm -hmm. the there surely is. There surely is. Let's go back to this tab, too. And thanks for highlighting that. If we scroll back to the discovery service, filter by database. We are searching a ton of databases here. So this is really what you're pulling in. And you can actually filter this by a specific database if you wanted to. And these databases that are listed are either databases to which we currently subscribe individually or some that might be provided as sort of a nice extra add-on from EBSCOhost. We get a lot of our databases from EBSCOhost. Other databases that are pulled in here are also some databases that we receive from the State Library of Kansas. And some of you may be familiar with that resource as well. So as you can see, we're getting a lot. But again, the caution that I give with this initial search that I did with the Discovery Service is huge. Because again, I didn't really narrow my search. I didn't really focus it. But as you can see, This is a very, very long list, and some of these are much less relevant as you go along. I'm going to close that. And so even though EBSCO is the provider of the discovery service, uh, that doesn't mean that we're limited to just the EBSCO databases that the library subscribes to. That's exactly it. We've gone ahead and linked those. Mm -hmm. So we're getting Science Direct. We might be getting a few databases through ProQuest, although we're not really subscribing to that many databases through ProQuest anymore. But yes, that's exactly it. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Oh, no, no, no. And thanks for stopping me, Sarah. And again, at any point, if there's anything that I'm not highlighting or that I need to go back over, absolutely let me know. Will do. Uh, <laughs> When you went to the uh, Science Direct, mm -hmm. and it took you to the Science Direct site, and you said, now we'll see if it lets us download the full text PDF. Right. I have been periodically you know, gone to places that look like that, and then yeah. lost because like they want to log in or something of that nature. Yes. I don't know how to log in to anything once I get to those. <clears throat> That is a great question. And are you talking specifically about the Science Direct service? No, um, because honestly, 
there is so much more there than you know every time i go there i feel like i learned something new so okay I don't okay i even be able to tell you exactly where i've gone where i've gotten stuff like that okay but i've experienced Okay, uh, let me see if I can answer. That's a great question. And let me see if I if I don't answer this completely, please stop me because I will try to. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and, and focus on Science Direct first as my example, and then we'll go on to some others. So Science Direct is really not a database to search in and of itself, although a lot of people will go ahead and search Science Direct as a database to find a lot of different references. Two cautions I give with that. With ScienceDirect, it is more of an e-journals package. And what I mean by that is we have, I just looked at our invoice today, we have probably about 20 journals through ScienceDirect, which is published by Elsevier, by the way. Um, we have probably about 20 journals to which the library subscribes directly electronically through Science Direct, and those include um, back files as well as current issues. So those particular 20 journals, including I think it's Journal of Academic Librarianship, um, we have a lot of library and information science journals that we subscribe to that. We are paying for the back files plus the current access of those. Science Direct will also include examples of this one, and I did want to go back to this tab, of open access journals that are published through Science Direct, but they are open access. And again, with open access, that's totally free. It is open for sharing of knowledge, sharing of information. A third layer of that, and this is actually what you do have to be very careful of, will be other journals that are that are provided through Science Direct that we are not subscribing to. And that third layer may well be when a patron encounters the abstract of the article and then has a prompt to log in or a prompt that, well, you can have the PDF of this, but you're going to have to pay $20 or $25. That's not an error. It's because that is a journal through Science Direct or through another package similar to that to which the library does not presently subscribe. So does that kind of help with your question? That's exactly the type of thing. I'm awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, I can give you just a real quick uh, good comparison with that, too. So probably all of you have done searches in Google Scholar, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Google Scholar is another really good example because Google Scholar provides a lot of linkages to HTML full text. It also provides a lot of linkages to preprints of articles. So if an author uh, writes an article, and then has uh, the right from the publisher to upload it into an institutional repository as a preprint an article. That's probably going to be indexed and picked up by Google Scholar. So you could get the preprint of the article, or you might get something in open access, or maybe the HTML full text. Mm -hmm. However, in Google Scholar, it's also not unusual to hit that paywall, that you see a reference to an article, you click on that article, and then, again, you hit the publisher's website, and the publisher says, well, you're either going to have to log in if you're a current subscriber, or you're going to have to pay for this. That is the point, and ScienceDirect is a good example of this, too. Use interlibrary loan through the library. I cannot emphasize that enough. Unless you really have to have something immediately, you are ESU students. You don't have to pay for that access to an article. We can get that to you through interlibrary loan. Um, it might take you know, a day or a couple of business days, but we will get you that PDF of the article. So don't pay unless, again, it's something that you absolutely have to have like you know, in a matter of minutes. So does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I just definitely want, wanted to clarify that. Okay. Before, before you go on. Yes, absolutely. Will you show them what the, the even before they put in a, an ILL request, will you yes. show them what they should do if they run into something, uh, a sign in EDS that says we don't subscribe to this? Absolutely. This would be perfect. I would love to do this. So I went back here to my link. And this is, again, this is my initial search that I did in the discovery service. Um, I'm going to see if I can find an example here because some of these we actually do have 
do, do, do. Let me scroll through here a little bit more. And I'm going to click on next. I'm going to see if I can find a good example, Sarah. So a lot of these are available through. You know, this actually might be a good example. Let's click on this one. So this is Exploring Academic Ebook Use Part 2 Through Focus Groups and Interviews. And this is from a journal called Performance Measurements and Metrics. Now, the database, again, this is kind of a, a, a misnomer. It says that this is from a database called Emerald Insight. This is actually, again, an e-journals package. And the package is actually called Emerald Management 120. So that's kind of a mouthful. But that, again, is a collection of e-journals in library and information science, plus the management-oriented journals. But let's click on Full Text Finder. Because I just want to see if I can get to the full text of this one. Oh, okay. I hit... I hit a brick wall with this one. So with that one, when I clicked on the link, and again, this is this is what can be a little bit of, of a misnomer. It looks like with this one, I should be able to get the full text, but you see that we did not because our library is not subscribing to performance measurement and metrics. That might be one we should subscribe to, by the way. I might have to file that one in the back of my mind. So this is what my next step would be. I do want to double check just to see if any other database or any other package that we subscribe to might have access to performance measurement and metrics. So you'll notice that I highlighted the title of the journal. I didn't highlight the title of the article. And the reason I didn't do that is I'm actually going to take this tab back again to our library's webpage. And this is our other new resource that I really wanted you to show, just in case you haven't had a chance to see this. On the Journals tab, you probably have used this in your research earlier to see if we had access to a journal. You still do this. But this is going to look a little bit different this time. So have any of you used the Journals tab um, this semester so far and gotten into the screen that's labeled browsing, does that look familiar to anybody? Yes. Okay. Well, the reason I wanted to show this to you is there are some really neat features with this. So browsing is a very visual way of finding out if the library has access to journals, either in electronic form from other resources, other databases, or if we happen to have them in print. Um, and if you needed an article that was only available in print form in our library, maybe an older article, do an interlibrary loan request for that and say that you're a distance education student because we will scan that article in print form, we'll scan it as a PDF and we will send that to you. So don't feel like you're out of luck with that. So just in case you have not had a chance to see how this works, I really like browsing because there's, there's a lot of neat things you can do with this. I am going to paste And I'm going to move this screen a little bit. This is what I wanted to do. So this took me to performance measurement and metrics. I'm going to click on this link. Because we're going to see whether we could actually get to this article or not. So the great thing about browsing is you can look at articles that are in press. Or let's go back over here. So I'm looking for April 11th, 2016. So I am going to have to change the year on this and go to 2016. And I need, it looks like volume 17, issue number one. Let's click on this. And let's see if it's actually going to let me get to the full text of this. And this is Exploring Academic Ebook Use. Page 83. Well, let's scroll down here. And let's just see what it's going to let me do. Aha! So let's click on this. And it's trying. It's thinking here. Okay, it lead me back into Emerald Insight. Let's see if it'll let me actually click on the PDF or if it's going to say, ah, oh, you're going to have to pay for this. 
there it is. Okay, so notice something that happened here. That full text finder link didn't work. Now, actually, I will be honest with you, it actually should have, but for some reason it didn't. But that's actually okay that it didn't because what I wanted to emphasize is don't immediately do an interlibrary loan request if you don't find the full text immediately in any database or any resource. Do what I just did. Find the title of the journal or the title of a book for that matter. Copy it and then for the journals, go to that journals tab, which will take you into browsing, copy and paste that and it may actually be able to link you to the full text of that article. Again, that link should have worked, but just for the sake of argument, if that hadn't been available, then it would have showed me if that journal had been available in another resource. So there's another way of getting to that bad. And sometimes uh, when you might have an interlibrary loan request bounce back to you, that's probably what's happened. Um, that article might be available, but it's going to be available in another database or in another resource in our library. So does that help? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. OK, great. Great. Well, while I'm in browsing, I do want to show you a couple of things here, just in case you haven't had a chance to see this. So notice on my screen, I'm actually logged in. Now, I don't have to be logged in to use browsing, so I'm just going to log out, but then I am going to log back in. And we are. I don't know why I did that. Oh, I know why I did that. Let's get back in here to Emporia State University. Okay. So the reason I logged out was that when you click on browsing, you don't have to be logged in. So it's, it basically is not working the same way that a database does. But with browsing, if you like, you can create an account for yourself. And that can be with your email address. And then it could be like with your same buzz in password or another password, just whatever would, would work for you. So why would you want to create a free account with, with browsing? Well, when you do that, Let's go back over here and, oh, stop that. Did not want that to do that. Okay, so let's go back to log in here. So now I'm gonna log into my account. And that's where you can sign up for one if you like. So again, why would I want to create a browsing account? And it's asking me again that I do wanna search an Emporia State University. Click to authenticate. And let's see if I am. Perfect. Okay, so now you see again that I'm logged in. So the reason I might want to do this is because of these two links over here, my bookshelf and my articles. With my bookshelf, you can actually name a shelf. And I might want to call this one focus groups. Focus groups research. There we go. So my bookshelf will actually let me save specific journals that I might want to browse in later on. So I can actually save titles of journals and then I could go back on my bookshelf with my bookcases, which I, I really like. And I could just remind myself, oh, I'd like to browse the latest issue of Journal of Library Administration. And I could do that easily without having to search for that title. But my other really favorite part is this one. My articles, this will actually let you save articles as you locate them in browsing. So do any of you use any um, bibliographic management programs like Zotero or Mendeley or EndNote? Not yet. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, if you're interested in, in so Zotero, um, I teach that on the Emporia campus. So if you ever you know want me to show that to you in a one-to-one -one research appointment on Zoom, I'd be happy to do that. Well, the reason I mentioned that is that those bibliographic software programs will let you set up collections so you can save your articles for future reference. Well, browsing is not as robust as Zotero or Mendeley, but it will let you create a new collection. So I might say I want this one to be also focus groups. So now as I browse for articles, and if I found something that looked interesting, but I just kind of wanted to save that for future reference, since I'm logged into browsing, then I could say that I wanted that article or a series of articles saved in 
a specific collection. So for organizing your research, this is really very handy. There's just a lot that you can do in browsing beyond just verifying if we have the full text available of an article or not. So, And there is a mobile interface, as you can see up here. You can download an app for browsing. So you can have that on your phone or your tablet, and it should authenticate with our ESU collection, just as I'm doing here. And then that way you can always have that available on, on the go with your articles. So, has anybody had a chance to do much with browsing? Yeah. I tend to use it the way you, uh, you demonstrate it. When I when I'm, want to be absolutely sure whether or not ESU subscribes to a particular journal. Exactly, exactly. And that really is one of its best features because as you see, it really helps to drill down to the article level, which our old uh, journals tab was, mm, it wasn't that great at doing. Uh, browsing will also um, link um, back to the catalog though, if you found that or if it finds that a particular journal is not available electronically, but again, if the library had access to the journal in print form or on microfilm, it will link back to the catalog, back to WorldCat, so that you can say, oh, okay, they don't have it available electronically, but they do have it on print or on microfilm with the year that I need. So again, that's where you go back and do an interlibrary loan request, and you can request that a copy of that article be scanned and then sent to you. So don't lose hope just in case that happens. Questions so far before we go any further? I'm not sure this is the right place to ask it, Cynthia, but you were talking, oh, please do. You were, you were talking about Science Direct, so, um, and that, that makes me think about Scopus. And I know that we don't subscribe to Scopus. Right. I have noticed that occasionally when I am looking at an article in Science Direct, I can get into a piece of Scopus. Yeah. Can you tell us, can you tell me why and how far I might be able to go with that? I'm just thinking for these guys, especially um, if they're chasing, trying to chase down. Oh, yeah. You know, a, a forward citation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it is my understanding, and Sarah, I would be happy to go back and do a little bit more research on this, send this to you, and you could forward this to, to everyone else as well. When I have worked a little, I've worked just very, very tentatively with, with Scopus. It is my understanding that there is a piece of Scopus that is indeed free, and I think that's why you can get a little bit into it, but then you're going to hit a point where you're not going to be able to do anything else unless the library actually subscribe to the entire Scopus service. But I'm thinking that's what happens. But let me do a little bit more research in that if I could, and I'll get back with you. That would be great. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, 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 because I'm very cognizant of, of the type of, of research that you all are going to need to do at this level. Um, kind of related to that, um, have you all had a chance to do much, or I know that you will need, need to it some point with cited reference searching. Say it again, cited reference. Cited, yeah. Um, basically cited references when you're tracking down the number of times that an article has actually been cited by others. Mm -hmm. Okay. Haven't done it yet. I Let's talk about that, Cynthia. I would love to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, I, I really didn't have that question on, on purpose, but I actually kind of wanted to because this is kind of a good segue. Uh, because again, I really want to be aware of the type of, of in-depth research that you all need to do at this level now, uh, where you are. So cited references, basically again, cited references are ways of finding out how many times a particular article has been cited by others in other books or other articles. It's not the only metric out there to judge the quality of an article. It can be one metric. So in other words, if I can see somehow that a specific article that I'm reading has been cited by a lot of other people, that might be a pretty good indication to me that that's a fairly seminal article in the field because people keep going back to it and at least you know they're talking about it and citing it maybe a little bit in other articles. I wish that we actually uh, could afford to subscribe to a service called Web of Science because Web of Science does 
cited reference searching, and you can do that as a patron. Um, it is very powerful. It's also tremendously expensive. So, you know, you kind of get what you pay for. But the reason I mentioned that is um, I am going to go back. Actually, I'm going to leave browsing, and I'm going to go back to the library's webpage. Some databases that we subscribe to will offer some links to cited references. And I do want to show you one that will actually do that. So I went to the databases, our A to Z list, and I'm going to go to the letter P. And I'm actually going to go to the Psych Info database. And I think this will let me drill down a little bit here. So the Psych Info database would be a go-to resource for any of you that are dealing with any topic for your dissertation proposal or for your dissertation that has any type of psychological connection, such as the psychological behaviors of patrons or the psychology of information use, something like that. I'm going to do a very quick search here. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. And this is something that I'm sure most of you are going to be familiar with. But I'm going to put focus groups. Again, I'm still thinking about doing research on focus groups. I'm going to put that in double quotation marks this time because I want Psych Info to search for that as a phrase together rather than the word focus over here and the word groups over here. So again, that's something probably most of you are very familiar with. So let's do focus groups and let's do This is an incredibly broad search. But the reason I'm doing this is that I just wanted to call, call up something. I need to see if I can get to references available. Ah, it worked. I thought that it would, would but I wanted to make sure. So let me um, show you what I did. So I did my initial search for focus groups and psychology. And then after I did that, there was over here a way of refining my results, and let me remove this, and I'm going to do this again for you. So I am now going to go back, and I want to limit this search to something called References Available. And if I do this, let's see if we can find something that looks kind of interesting here. Oh, that one looks interesting. Using focus group and rush item response theory, theory to improve instrument development. So I'm going to click on this Cited References link. And essentially what this tells me is that this particular article has been cited 68 times. And here are all of the different articles that actually have wound up citing this specific article. So 68 may or may not be a lot, but this is also, again, a good way of sort of growing your research and kind of working a little bit, I wouldn't necessarily backwards, but really thinking about some related articles. So if I were to keep looking on this, it looks like this one is a book called Focus Group Research, and it is indeed an item in this case, a book that actually cited this original article. So that might be an interesting, art, pardon me, an interesting book for me to track down to see if we owned it or if I needed to get it through interlibrary loan and actually see how this article was actually cited in that resource. So again, cited references are not available in every database. It just depends upon the database. PsycInfo is one that will do that for you. So that, again, can be kind of an interesting way to see how many times an article that you're interested in has actually been cited by, by other people. Does that sort of help or kind of give you some other ideas for researching? Okay. okay. Um, Sarah, can I ask a question at this point, too? Because I want to make sure that I'm covering everything that, that everyone there needs at this point in their research. Um, I was thinking of specifically about the ESU Institutional Repository uh, for 
our dissertations and theses, and then I was also thinking about the dissertations and theses full text database. Would you like me to show those? Yes, I think that'd be a good idea. That's what I was thinking too. I think this would be perfect at this point. So let's go back again. And again, what I want to do is really focus upon resources that are really going to be pertinent for your specific information needs. And that's why I asked that question. So one thing that you will want to do, and probably a lot of you are already thinking about this, um, when you're starting to develop a topic for your dissertation, it's really sometimes very interesting to see, have other people actually written dissertations about that topic? And even if they have, have they taken a different approach? Do they have perhaps some references? Again, thinking about cited references, are there references in their bibliographies that you might want to draw from and maybe read some of those sources as well? We do have two ways of getting to the full text of various dissertations and theses. So the first one I want to show you is actually right back here at our library's webpage. And this is our link for our Institutional Repository Collection, or ECIRC for short. So have any of you had a chance to look at this before? I, I see some okay. heads nodding yes. I don't know if you can see them or not. I turned the okay. light. <laughs> okay. oh, well, I can see a little bit, but not much. So, okay. So if you've had a chance to see this, this is probably going to look familiar, but I just want to make sure that you are comfortable and that you know um, what is going on with this. Yes. So with eCERC, this is where um, Emporia State's current dissertations from the School of Library and Information Management, and then also current theses from our other departments are now being scanned and housed. So basically what that means is if you were, if you were to click on this link for dissertations, and you wanted to take a look and see, here are the most recent submissions. And we just most recently had two graduated, like you all will be do doing with their PhDs, my colleague Terry Summy and then Brian Schwartz. And this would be a link to the PDFs of their dissertations. And as you can see, I could keep going back here. And I can do the same thing. I can browse. I can search within this collection, but I can also browse by year. And that is one of the easiest ways of getting a sense of what your colleagues have already written previously in terms of dissertations, what their topics have been, and also from a very practical perspective. If we click here, we'll wait for this. From a very practical point of view, you can actually read and see the structure of the dissertation. So you can see how it begins with an abstract. How the cover page should look. Any acknowledgments? The table of contents. And the way tables and lists of figures should appear, as well as the actual text of the dissertation itself. That is a really handy thing to be able to do, and I'm probably most of you have had a chance to do that at some point. But just in case you haven't, I just wanted to show you that this is how you can get access to our more recent dissertations published at ESU. But let's go back a little bit further. And I went back to the library's web page. So to broaden my search, I actually might want to start looking, though, at other dissertations and even other theses, but especially other dissertations that have been written by at other institutions. And to do that, we're going to go back to our databases again, back to the letter P. And now we're going to go to ProQuest Dissertations and Theses Global. And this is an incredible resource. So ProQuest has been the housing place, really more of a clearinghouse of dissertations and theses for decades. They just have a huge, huge collection. And back in the somewhat bad old days, it used to be that the only way of getting um, access to a copy of a dissertation from another institution was to do an interlibrary loan request 
or pay request for the hard copy or the microfilm of the dissertation. Well, the reason that we subscribe to this resource, and I really encourage you to use this, is that you can get, in many cases, the PDF full text of a range of dissertations and theses, again, that are published by institutions other than ESU. So if I were to go to my advanced search, and I'm going to do my limits again. Let's do focus groups. There we are. Got my hands on the wrong part of the keyboard. And libraries. Again, I'm doing a rather broad search right now. You notice that limit to full text. The reason that that's there is that um, you actually will get indexing of dissertations and theses that are not available in full text because they may be a little bit older, or in some cases, uh, the author of the dissertation or thesis may have decided not to release the electronic reproduction rights of their dissertation or, or thesis. And you do have a right to do that. Um, if you think you're going to be publishing it as a book and you think, well, you know, I kind of want to hold on to this research for, for right now, that is something that you can opt to do. But I'm not going to limit right now. I'm just going to go ahead and search. And this is something that I, I love. I do have, a, have an example here I want to show you as well. So my first one, ooh, that looks really interesting. Library anxiety, the information search process, and doctoral use of the library. Hmm, that sounds kind of interesting. Now, that was published in 2003. And you'll notice, as this is loading here, that we actually will get the PDF, and this is the entire dissertation. I just think this is fantastic to be able to get, get a hold of. Really use this database, again, to see, has anybody else written anything in your topic? Or even if they have, maybe they took a little bit of a different approach than the way that you would want to take your topic. And when we go back up here, you notice that I can get in related items, so it's kind of giving me some related dissertations or even some related, actually related articles as well as dissertations. Here's some good possibilities here. So use that to expand your research. And back up on this button, I could just very easily download this PDF to my computer or save it on a flash drive, whatever I would want to do. There is an email option, but I want to show you what would happen in this case. And I have an example on my email I'm going to show you as well. So when I click on email, in this instance, it's actually not going to email the dissertation to you. Um, it would email, and actually you can include the citation for the dissertation in APA format, and that would be at the end of your email, and then put in your email address and your name. What it's actually going to do is email a permanent link, a permalink to that document. So it's not going to be the actual dissertation as a file, but this is what the email would look like. And I'm going to call this up here. I'm probably going to stop sharing for just a second because I don't think. Are you seeing my email that says your ProQuest research? No, we're still seeing Okay. It. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought. I need to go ahead. I'm going to do a new share here. I didn't think that you would, but I just wanted to make sure. Here we are. Okay, are you seeing that now, an email that says your ProQuest research? Yes, yes we are. Awesome, good, good, good. Okay, so I wanted to show you, I did this this afternoon. So this is what this would look like. If you email a citation or a link from ProQuest dissertations and theses full text. So this is what I'm getting. This is the one that I emailed to myself. And I do have a couple of links down here. I'm going to click on this link and see if all goes well. Ah, yes, it worked. That was a permalink back to the link from the ProQuest database so I could still get back to that. However, in 
actual circumstances, I would probably just sort of cut to the chase and go ahead and download the PDF. But I also might want to just save something. I might not be ready to download this as yet. So I could email a lot of links to myself through the ProQuest Dissertations database, and that would give me a chance to go back and look later on. So um, does that kind of help in thinking about ways of maybe broadening your research a little bit more? Okay. I think it does. Um, you have brought up another question of mine. Oh, good. This is from this is back from my librarian days. <laughs> One of the challenges that we had um, with our system of authentication at that time was that if you emailed yourself a link to an article, oh yes, and you open the email at home. Mm -hmm. So you weren't on the institutional network, right? You couldn't get where you wanted to go because right. it wasn't recognizing you as an authorized user. Is that still a challenge? It okay. is. Oh gosh, Sarah, I'm so glad you brought that that up. It is still a challenge in some databases, but it is much less of a challenge than it than it used to be because a lot of databases. And I'm going to see if I can find an example here. We're still looking at your email, Cynthia. You might want to. Oh, okay. That's all. That's that's okay. That's okay because I'm going to pull up uh, something first, and then I'll I'll share this with you. Okay. So I will do this on my end, and then I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to have you still look at my my email for just a second because I do want to do a really quick search here, and then I'm going to show you what my screen looks like. Here we go. So hang on for. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, Sarah, because it's so frustrating. And then it's hard to explain, especially to, in an academic library, it's hard to explain that to a freshman student, but it's also hard for any of the rest of us. Okay, let me try something here. And then I will then I will be sure and share my screen with you. But I want to check something here. Ah, I found it. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop this and I'm going to share my screen that I found for you. Okay. So I just popped back into the library literature. Pardon me. The library and information science source database, which is our go-to for library and information science. And I just, I did a very quick search on focus groups and libraries, and I went ahead and went to an article called When Definitions and Practice Do Not Align with the Literature. Now, this one does happen to have the HTML full text, but even if it had the PDF, this is what I wanted to show you. Most of the EBSCOhost databases, and I think other uh, vendors are doing this now, are creating something called a permalink. And when you click on that, you can copy and paste that, or you can copy it, um, paste it, and then email it to yourself, which is what a lot of people will do. And that permalink is exactly it. It kind of bypasses all those weird, difficult proxy issues, and it will take you back to this screen with the record and to the article. And that can be really handy if you want to save something, but you're not maybe ready to take a look at it. So always look for something within a resource or a database that will offer you a permalink option, and that should bypass those difficulties. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I feel like I'm covering a lot of things, but I also want to make sure that I am addressing anything that's still out there. So what questions might still be hanging out there. Um, I want to know how do you find a DOI when it's required and so how do you track that down? When you track that down, okay. I am going to make a confession. I'm not nearly as good at this as I should be, but let's go back up here because I'm in Google Chrome, so I'm searching within Google. There are DOI finders out there. And this is probably 
the link that I would go to, although, let's see, that is actually asking to DOI. That's asking, looking for a DOI. We kind of need more of how you identify that. How do I, yeah, let's do this. Here we go. How do I locate a DOI? Like I said, I'm not nearly as good at that as I should be. Crossref. I maybe it might be Crossref. I need to do a little bit more research in that, but Crossref may do that because I know sometimes DOIs can be optional, and sometimes you might have a professor who will actually require that that to be part of that APA citation. Mm -hmm. uh, let me do a little bit more research on that because I know there are different ways of doing that. Now, having said that, um, I keep going back to PsycInfo. I, I, I don't know. I, I do that because I, I teach that, that a lot. The PsycInfo databases, it's from the American Psychological Association, will always include a DOI. Uh, as part of their citation, if you uh, pull up a citation uh, within that database. And I know some do and some don't. So let me do a little bit more research in that too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking that Crossref will really do that for you, but I kind of need to dig into that that a little bit more. So I'm kind of making some some notes and I'll, I will get back with you all and I'll send Sarah uh, whatever I find as well. Thank you. That's a great question. Other questions that are hanging out there for the research that you're currently doing or getting ready to do? I thought of one more, Cynthia. Oh, good. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking back to my librarian days. Um, yeah. At one point, we were exploring um, the capability of having uh, a Google Scholar search. Mm -hmm. I, the uh, results screen, uh, identify for our students those articles to which in that appear that were in journals that our library subscribed to. Right. So I'm not sure I said that right, but it was, um, and, and at that time you had to, uh, the library had to register with Google Scholar. Yes. Is that something that you guys have explored? We explored that at one point with Google Scholar, and I think we had that partially set up, but let me see. I remember, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. As as everybody made it sound. Right. Okay, I'm going into here. That's my library, but I know, I know what you're talking about. Oh, not what I wanted to do. That is something else. I thought that, you know, Sarah, I thought that we had set that up at one time. I know that we were getting really close to that. But like you said, it didn't sound like it was as, as, as seamless as it would sound like it would be originally, but I know at one point we had Google Scholar set up, so at least it would sort of point you in the direction of what we had. Yeah. I will take a look and kind of see where we are at that point as well, because I know that's been a number of, of years ago, but I know we were going in that direction. I remember that very clearly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Got my little, little, little no, no, notes, so I will follow up. <laughs> Other questions that are hanging out there? And again, I want to make sure that you do have my contact information. That's all I can think of. I, you were going to show us something else in your email. Wasn't you? Oh, that was, uh, that was the um, email that I showed you, I think, with, with the ProQuest research. Mm -hmm. Oh, the link. Yes. Yeah, I think I think that was probably what I was was covering. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, because I wanted to show you what that what that link looked like when I emailed that that citation from ProQuest dissertations. Well, I think you've covered everything that 
I can throw at you at least. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, that's why I love working with you so much because it's, it's we, we always think of, of other things. And I love it when, when these questions come up and like, that's a really good question. I'm going to go back and look at that that a little bit more because it's always something that, that we need to do. Um, I did want to go back to the library's web page. Are you seeing that again on your screen? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go to buy About Us and under Library Directory. You can always reach me. Um, if you ever want to just um, call me and leave me a voicemail, call 620-341 and then the phone extension after that. And my phone extension is 5480. Um, and if I don't happen to be there, leave me a voicemail. If you have your email enabled like on your own computer, you can click on my link here and that will pop into an email. I'm going to go ahead and do this. It'll just pop into that if you had that set up on and enabled on your own computer. My email is ckane1 at emporia.edu. Be sure to put the one in because um, there really isn't any other ckane and it might go somewhere else kind of floating around in cyberspace. But please email me. And like I said, if you ever would want to set up a one-on-one -on -one research consultation with me through Zoom, let me know. I'd be very happy to do that. Then we could share our screens back and forth and kind of discuss the research that you're doing right now. All right, Cynthia, thank you so much. You're very graceful about all of these questions that I've got. <laughs> These are the kinds of questions that I love because, like I said, I like different challenges. So, and like I said, I will go ahead and um, I'll I'll end the recording and then get that converted into a YouTube link, and then Sarah, I'll send that in your direction, and then uh, do some research on the other questions that we have as well. Perfect. Sounds good. Cynthia. Thank you again. You're welcome. You all have a good rest of the evening and have a good day tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Good night. Oh, okay. <laughs> what?